I have a great, great pleasure of introducing Dr. Paul Lipton, and he's a professor of neuroscience and director of the undergraduate neuroscience program with the College of Arts and Sciences. He is also the director of the undergraduate research opportunity program, which funds for faculty mentored research by undergrads in the humanities, natural sciences, um, the medicine, arts, and education. He has a BA in economics from the State University of New York at Buffalo and a doctorate in psychology at BU. What a combination. He often, often uses neuroscience as a way to engage students and to ignite their passion for scientific research. What a privilege. I welcome Dr. Lipper. For my ninth birthday, my dad brought me and my older sister to Yankee Stadium. First time I was ever in a professional ballpark. First time I ever saw a professional ball game. And if you've ever been to the original Yankee Stadium, it is an absolutely tremendous experience. It's a palace for a nine-year-old, for a 40-year-old, doesn't matter who you are. Uh, I was particularly excited because I was going to see my baseball idol at the time, Reggie Jackson. For those of you who are a little bit older, you remember who he was. Number 44, he was the right fielder for the Yankees, and he was also known as Mr. October because in Game 6 of the 1977 World Series, Reggie Jackson hit three home runs against the Dodgers to bring the Yankees the World Series victory. Blew my mind. So this was a tremendous experience for me. And being that it was so important, I have a particular recollection of that day. It's really two things that I remember, at least I think I remember. Um, one was that Reggie Jackson tripped over first base and sprained his ankle and got pulled from the game. The second is that I don't remember seeing very much of the game because I remember dragging my sister around the ballpark just out of curiosity, right? You got everybody selling pretzels and beer and, and every, every kind of paraphernalia you can think of. So I just, I have very little recollection of what happened at the game. So being that I study memory, I, a couple years ago, was really curious about this early experience of mine because it's, you know, my family knows that I have, uh, I, have un I am unsettlingly amnesic, and so I, I don't remember a whole lot from my childhood. But this is something that was particularly salient for me. Uh, so I, I went to look up online to see if I could find any information about Reggie Jackson having uh, sprained his ankle, and there was nothing there. And I thought, huh, interesting. So I called my sister and said, hey, do you remember this time we went to Yankee Stadium? She's like, oh yeah, your ninth birthday. Uh, yeah, that, that was the game that Reggie Jackson flipped over first base. And I said, but, um, are you sure? She goes, absolutely. I remember it very clearly because we were sitting on, first base, on the first baseline. We didn't move from our seats. We had these amazing seats. And I thought, huh. I wondered, were we at the same game? <laughs> this is the funny thing about memory. Memory is, is, is a constructive process. Um, it's not, you, what you do not have, and I'm sure you all recognize this, you don't have a vertical representation of every experience you've ever had. If you did, it would probably be a bit unpleasant. But what you do have is something that seems uh, somewhat recognizable to past experiences that you've had. And when you think about what's going on with memory, it makes some sense. The experience you're having right now is now being stuffed into some sort of memory box that is basically one of every other experience you've ever had. So you can appreciate that what you right now might be experiencing as something new and try to remember later is going to be mixed up with everything else you've done. So there's a lot of interference. What I want to know, studying memory, is can I go back and find that memory? Can I, find, can I look in the brain and see where it is, see what it looks like, maybe manipulate it, maybe delete it, somewhat along the lines of eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, maybe a little bit of inception. <laughs> and so what, again, what I want to do is focus in on a particular part of the brain. It turns out that this yellow structure here on both sides of the brain is called the hippocampus. This is a very prominent structure in memory, and we know that from decades of research, uh, from animal research, from looking at patients who've had some sort of an, uh, traumatic brain injury or stroke or just aging. And what we know is that if you were to look in the hippocampus, uh, while someone's performing a task you do it using fMRI or sticking electrodes in, in their brain, little fine wires, you would see memory in action. You would see individual neurons. You would see the brain region as a whole light up. This is great, but it doesn't quite answer the question. 
what it does answer is that a particular area of the brain is involved in memory. What it also tells you is that the individual cells play some role. It doesn't tell you that the area is necessary, nor does it even tell you that it's sufficient. So what you want to be able to do really, Francis Crick actually said this in 1979, he said, what neuroscience needs is the ability to go in and manipulate individual neurons and evoke memories, evoke individual memories. This is not what we can do with some of the past technology. So what we can now do is we can now go into the hippocampus and visualize a memory and manipulate this. And so this is what I want to talk a little bit about. And I just want to say that the experiments that I'm going to talk about were all done by Steve Ramirez and Shu Lu, his collaborator at MIT. Steve Ramirez was a, a, a member of the first graduating class in the neuroscience program, has gone on to finish his PhD, and has done some tremendous work in this area. So the goal here is to be able to find a memory and manipulate it. Now, uh, we're obviously not going to do that in humans because there's a lot of limitations. But we are going to do that in a little guy like this. All right. So this guy will allow us to do something like that. Now, to be able to do something like this, to be able to go in and visualize a memory and then manipulate it, you need a, a certain tool. We can stuff electricity in the brain. And because neurons, the brain cells f use electricity to fire, that would activate neurons. But the problem is that's pretty damaging. We could instead use drugs. Drugs are very effective at starting neurons, stopping neurons, but they're nonspecific. We don't know what neurons they're targeting, nor can we really time lock that to any particular event. We need something else. We need something that works at, the, at a physiological time scale that makes sense within the brain. And that physiological time scale is at the level of milliseconds, something that's extremely fast. And we want to be able to target these individual cells, not, not just a group of them. Turns out, back in 1969, there was a researcher, a German researcher, named Dieter Osterheldt. And he was interested in learning how to use electron microscopy to study some little organism. And it turns out that he had to go to San Francisco from Germany to learn how to use this technique. The lab he ended up in was studying a little, um, a little bacteria. It's called archibacteria. And the things aren't working. Um, a little bacteria. And at the time, the, the form of membranes uh, wasn't really that clear. The function of them, they didn't know a whole lot about them. Remember, this is 1969. While they were studying this little organism, they happened to put it under the light. And when they put it under the light, the membrane, this purple membrane, turned yellow. When they took the light off it, it turned purple again. This was extremely curious. They had no idea what was going on. But what they did have a sense of is that maybe this resembled something that they knew a little bit about from some work that had been done about 11 years ago, 1958. Someone had identified and articulated how we see. That is, you have a chemical in the back of the cells in your retina that when they see light, a chemical a transformation occurs, and they convert that light into energy, energy that the brain understands as the language of the brain. At the time, he proposed this. He called this uh, bacteria rhodopsin, rhodopsin being that chemical in the retina that undergoes that transformation. Nobody believed him. Everybody said, this, this rhodopsin does not exist in, in unicellular organisms. He persevered, published his work, and about 40 years later, a research group in Stanford, not necessarily purposefully following up on their research, but recognizing that we need a time-locked mechanism to be able to manipulate individual neurons, they genetically programmed this little rhodopsin molecule, like a little switch, a little light switch, so that if you were to take this little light switch and flip on a switch, it would, when implanted into neurons, if you turn the light on, it would activate the neuron. When you turn it off, the neuron would turn off. So again, based on this research from 19, uh, 1969, 1971, they were able to identify a, me a mechanism that we can use in neuroscience to specifically ma manipulate individual neurons. <clears throat> so with that, with, armed with this technology, how do we want to deal with this? Right? What are we going to do with these animals? How are we going to manipulate them? How are we going to identify memories? How are we going to be able to identify a specific memory and so on? <clears throat> well, it turns out that when neurons are active, 
they release a little tag. It's almost as though you were all genetically programmed that as you're paying attention, your hand was raised so that I knew who was paying attention. Brain cells in the hippocampus do the very same thing. So what we can do is knowing which brain cells are active in any particular time, we can then implant that specific molecule, that rhodopsin molecule. And then once we've identified the brain cells, try to reactivate that memory and do whatever it is we want to do with it. This is actually a slice from a mouse brain, and you're looking at a memory. This mouse was in a particular environment, and they, they labeled the brain cells, as I said. They activated them, and then they took the brain out, and they were able to say, here is a memory of that animal in that, in that, in that box. All right. Turns out about 6% of the neurons in this brain area are active for that particular memory, which is great. The next step was, be to, was, was to see in a real animal whether an animal undergoing some sort of experience they could identify that memory. So what they did was, they took this little guy, and you could see there's a little light, sh those, those are fiber optic cables shining that light into his brain. They would take the animal and put them in a box. And this is a box an animal hasn't been in before. Usually they spend their lives in their little home cages. And it's unique, it's got a unique constellation of cues. It's got an interesting floor, ceiling, and so on. What we know about these little animals is that when they go into a new environment, they like to run around a lot. They're really curious. They like to smell things. They like to poop on things. They like to do everything you can imagine in this little environment. And what we also know is they have a very stereotyped behavior that when they're startled a little bit, they freeze. They hold still. They make believe that nobody can see them. Right? So they try to remain hidden to the outside world. And again, we call this freezing. So what, these, what Steve and Shu did was they would put this animal in this box administer a shock, so the animal, a little, a little mild foot shock to the animal's feet using those bars, so the animal really remembers this environment. <laughs> then they put the animal in a second environment that looked entirely different from the other, where nothing bad happened. And what they wanted to see was if they went and reactivated the memory from the first box while the animal was in the second box, what would happen? So just as a schematic, take the animal, put it in box one, identify the memory of that box one, Give him a little foot shock so he really remembers that environment. Put him in box two. Turn the light on, flipping that switch so you activate those neurons that were active in the blue box and ask, what does his behavior look like? Right? We want to see, does this animal, can we artificially recreate the animal's experience of the first box while he's in the second box? So what you're going to see is the animal walking around. He's exploring. He's curious. He's sniffing things. He's not doing the other things. Um, and right now, he's just, again, he's not been in this box before. He's really curious. And what you'll see is that as soon as the light turns on, he stops. He stops moving. What these guys managed to do was, in this novel environment, recreate call back on the memory of the animal experience in that previous box. All right? This is something that had never been done before. This was a tremendous experience because it is all we've ever been able to do is just observe an animal or observe the activity in the brain. Here they were able to actually demonstrate that those neurons were necessary and sufficient in a way. All right? So here, the animal's experience in the yellow box is to remember what was going on in the blue box. All right, so they demonstrated a proof of concept. They can, re they can recapture a memory from some past experience. Well, they wanted to take this the next step further. They wanted to ask, now that we can actually identify and call up a memory, can we change it? Right? So what they did in this experiment was they put an animal in this first box. And they, again, they identified the cells that were active, that is the memory of that blue box. They put the animal now in a second box, in a red box. Just like they did before, while the animal's in the red box, they turn the light on to elicit the memory of the blue box. While the animal is ostensibly remembering the blue box, they applied a mild foot shock. So what they're doing here is trying to now take a memory from one experience and associate it with something new, artificially. And then they ask the question, what would happen then after you've artificially made this association, what would happen if you put the animal back in the blue box? And the animal froze. The animal all of a sudden had the experience of, whoa, this did, this, this, I guess this happened here, right? So here they're able to demonstrate that they can take a memory, they can manipulate that memory, 
and they can recall it. This is the Inception project, right? They've just provided the, the, the scientific evidence that Inception is a real movie, <laughs> right? Or what happened actually does happen. Okay, so they can identify a memory, they can, uh, they can manipulate a memory. Next, they turn themselves to thinking about this in a therapeutic sense. They wanted to ask, well, can we, t can we take a memory that we can identify and manipulate and use it for good, right? Can we change the animal's experience of something that is generally aversive? And what they chose to focus on was uh, depression and anxiety. We have a very good depression and anxiety model in animals. And really what it looks like is animals are just anhedonic. In other words, they don't, they don't seek out pleasurable experiences. And what that might look like is if you're given a choice between a regular bottle of water and sugar water, an animal will, who is well adjusted will choose the sugar water almost every time. An anhedonic animal will not. Will just, I don't care, you know, give me whatever, it doesn't matter. So what they did to test this out was they paired a male mouse with a female mouse. The male mice love this, right? It's a very positive experience for the male mice. So they're, first of all, they're creating a positive experience in the male mice. Then what they do is they take the male mice and, you know, they, they, uh, they, give them a, they make them struggle a little bit. And all, the, all they're actually doing is just really swaddling the animal. The animals don't love to be swaddled. And so it provides a little bit of anxiety, and after a little while, the animal starts to feel a little depressed. And you can tell because it just becomes kind of listless. So then what they did was they gave the animal the choice, as I said. They said, would you like the sugar water? Would you like the regular water? And these animals who had undergone this aversive experience, who were ostensibly depressed or anxious, chose equally. In other words, just exactly as you'd expect. They didn't care what they got. But then, while these animals were given the choice, just as before, they flipped the switch and activated those positive memories while the animal was trying to make a choice. And what they found was, in this case, the animals chose the sugar water. In other words, they were able to go in there, into an animal who was suffering from sort of anxiety and depression, again, defined loosely, of course, because it's an animal model. But they were able to go in and manipulate that memory to turn it into a positive experience. The therapeutic potential for this is, of course, endless. This is, this is one of the limitations here, of course, is that this is an invasive process. That's quite a beep. Um, <laughs> it's an invasive process. Newer technology allows you to go manipulate and call upon these memories without actually breaking into the brain. And so my hope is that at some point, I'm going to go back, I'm going to find my memory of Reggie Jackson, and figure out where it's gone, can I bring it back? But my goal isn't to make my memory the same as my sister's memory. My goal is to preserve my memory and preserve my sister's memory and celebrate the differences that we have. And there you go, thank you. So can you, are you able to this one on? All right. Are you able to instill the memory or the, like the sensation of happiness in a mouse that has previously not been happy? You mean an animal who's predisposed to unhappiness? <coughs> no, like you had to previously um, either give it the memory or treat it to be happy to recognize what that was, <laughs> and then you could turn on the switch. Could you take a mouse that had not experienced this and turn on the same ah, switch and make it happier? Uh, I presume there's a bit of a ceiling with the animals here. It's hard to know. Ex so if you, were asking the, if you were to look at their preference, there's only so much of the positive water, of the, the sugar water they're going to drink, for example. There are other examples that they used. Um, uh, you hit a ceiling effect pretty quickly, right? Uh, but but that, that, that's an interesting question, right? What, do you want to go into people and make us all happier? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, like, how did you like keep uh, the over here? Oh, hi. Uh, like, how did you like keep like the stimulation of like those specific neur neurons like isolated to those neurons? Like, so when you were like imitating like the positive memories, how did you keep it isolated to just those? Like, so, parts? 
technically, when the cell is active, it's, again, it's got that little tag that I mentioned. And what you can do is, <coughs> uh, while the animal, you, you, actually use in pharmacology, use, um, you inject, so you actually have to breed the animal, first of all, so there's two steps here. You breed the animal to express the tag. Then what you've got to do after the animal's you know, a certain age, you actually inject them with the gene for that, that rhodopsin molecule. And, the, and basically, all the cells in the area you inject pick it up. But what you want to do is have only those cells that are expressing the memory actually express the gene for that rhodopsin molecule. And the way that you, the, the way that you uh, navigate that is you administer in the animal's food something called doxycycline, which is a version of uh, an antibiotic. While the animal's on doxycycline, that rhodopsin molecule will not be expressed. So for the window that the animal's in the box where you want that animal to remember, you take the animal off the doxycycline so that only in those cells that are encoding that memory will express that channel rhodopsin. That's how you do it. Sue, thank you.